want to say a word of appreciation to Chuck Quigley, who's standing back there, and to Carl Kurtz, Jan Goering, Tam Taylor, I think Elaine, is she Elaine Larson here? She's here. Ken Nelson is here, Phil Duncan, and Mark Moley, so many others that I've had the pleasure of working with. And I really deeply appreciate what these folks have done with regard to increasing our knowledge of representative democracy in America. I happen to think I'll be talking a little bit about this at the Congress at least, and I think probably more broadly, representative democracy is under a genuine stress. And it needs all the civic education that we can muster in this country to uh, strengthen it. We had a Speaker of the House some years ago by the name of John McCormick, and uh, he was a great debater. Uh, every now and then he'd get restless sitting up there in the speaker's chair and come down onto the floor. Somebody would invariably irritate him in the debate. And in a very elaborate and courteous way, he would turn to that person and say, I hold the gentleman from Iowa in minimum high regard. <laughs> I want you to know, I've, I've been told who you are. You're master teachers. That's the way they described you to me. And because you are, I hold you in maximum high regard <laughs> and have enormous appreciation for what you do. Part of that is because I married a teacher. Indeed, she got me through law school. <laughs> I've always told her it was a pretty good investment, never totally persuaded her of that. Uh, but I really do have enormous respect for the teaching profession. And I know that the influence you have uh, extends far, far beyond uh, what most of the rest of us can do. And I speak my personal appreciation <clears throat> to you. Now, my job is to talk a little bit about the Congress. I just heard some marvelous remarks from these state legislators. I don't know that I need to say anything much more. Uh, but I want to address the question for a few minutes about how you go about understanding uh, this institution of the United States Congress. Great big Capitol building. Tens of thousands of people visit there every year right next to Disneyland, I think, in terms of popularity. <laughs> Institution that uh, profoundly affects your life. I'll talk about that in a moment. Puzzles us, angers us, rarely pleases us. A puzzling institution. How do you understand it, and how do you as a teacher have to explain it? Well, I think there's several simple things. When you go in to vote for a member of Congress, there's a title there. It says United States Representative. It doesn't say United States Congressman or Congresswoman. It says United States Representative. And that's a very key point to understand because the Congress of the United States is a representative body. This is a great big complicated country. When I went to high school, we had 130, 130 million people. Now, that's a long time ago. What is it today? It's over 300 million, isn't it? So in my working lifetime, the country is far more than doubled in size. I don't know what the projections are for the years ahead, but likely we'll grow more. But not only that is the size, it's the diversity, isn't it? So I go into a section of Miami not long ago, come out of the hotel, want to get a newspaper, put 50 cents in the slot. It says the Miami Herald. I draw it out. The paper can't read a word of it. <laughs> it's all in Spanish. I turn to the fellow on the street. I said, where's an English language newspaper? Oh, he said, we don't have anything like that around here. <laughs> so you got to walk down the street a half a mile. I did. 
I walked into the store, had a big sign, English is spoken here. <laughs> I'm not talking about Mexico City. I'm talking about Miami. Diversity, bigness, representative democracy. How do you represent 300 million people and all of this diversity? There's many ways to illustrate that, of course. And that's what the Congress is all about. A representative. These young ladies, young by my standards anyway, are representatives. And they said in a very effective way how important it was for them to listen to their people. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Trying as a representative to understand the hopes and the dreams and the ambitions and the desires of the American people. And then to take that and translate it into public policy through legislation. That's what the Congress tries to do. It's a representative democracy. But that's not all. It is also a very accessible branch of government. Suppose you got a complaint. I know you all never have complaints against government, but suppose, just <laughs> hypothetically, you can't call up the President of the United States and say, Mr. Bush, I'd like to talk to you about a problem I got down the street here. You can't call up the Vice President you can't, if it's a foreign policy matter, you can't call up the Secretary of State. You can't call up the Deputy Secretary of State. That's not because those people don't want to talk to you. They're busy. Who do you call up? Member of Congress. Your state representative. They are accessible. That's a hugely important asset of the United States Congress or of a state legislature to be accessible. When was the last time you went to a church supper with a defense secretary? <laughs> I know Bob Gates, I don't know if he, I'm not even sure he goes to church suppers, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, you get the point. It's an accessible body You've got a complaint, or maybe you've got a compliment. You call up the member of Congress or the state legislature. It's a deliberative body. Now, let me tell you up front, I'm getting a little worried about this in the United States Congress. But the core of the Congress should be a deliberative body. You were talking about debate and discussion. You know what it's all about? It's all about trying to build a consensus behind a solution. That's what you're trying to do in the Congress or in the state legislature. And that's tough to do with all of the diversity I mentioned a moment ago and the bigness. You and I can sit down over here in the corner with a cup of coffee and probably solve most every problem in the world pretty quickly. <laughs> Doesn't amount to a diddly damn. You don't have a solution until you got 218 votes in the House, 60 votes in the Senate. Senate is not a majoritarian body. You gotta have 60 votes. And you gotta have the President's signature. And if you don't have that, you're not in business. That's the way the country works. You deliberate, you debate, you do have conflict. It's ongoing, it's never ending. Now, I'm worried about this quality of deliberation in the United States Congress. Members come in Tuesday night. They vote on a couple of naming a post office. They named a post office after me, for God's sake. <laughs> then they go to work Wednesday, want to get out Thursday. How do you deliberate? How do you build consensus? If you're working two or three hours, two or three days a week, not two or three hours, no goodness, two or three days a week. I've had a little experience building consensus. We had five Democrats, five Republicans on the Iraq study group. 
We had five Democrats, five Republicans on the 9-11 Commission. I don't know how you build consensus unless you talk to one another. If you know how to do it, let me know. And talk. And talk. And talk. I remember driving across the 14th Street Bridge at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning after some of our deliberations in those meetings and saying to myself, we're never going to make it. We can't agree. But we go back the next day and start over again. And we talk through the problems. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes a willingness to reach an agreement, not always present. That's the way you build consensus. That's what the Congress is all about. That's what the legislature is all about. You know the great skill that's needed in a politician today? Maybe you get that question. I get it all the time. What kind of skill do you need to be a good politician? Well, you can say a lot of different things. But you know what the skill I look for is? The ability to build consensus. That's it. Anybody can walk into a room where you've got differences of opinion and blow it apart. I know because I've done it a few times. <laughs> you know what's really hard? What's really hard is to walk into that room and bring people together. And I'm not just talking about politicians. Could be the church. Could be the hospital. Could be the school. The political skill of bringing people together is in my mind the skill we're most deficient on today and we need the most. It's all part of deliberation. Congress is an independent branch of government. Co-equal branch of government. Anybody believe that? <laughs> I don't. Co-equal branch. That's what the Constitution's all about, isn't it? Separation of powers. The Congress shall have the power to declare war. It's a total nullity. When's the last time we declared war? I can't answer my own question. <laughs> it goes back to World War II. We have intervened militarily about every year and a half since World War II ended, somewhere, sometimes big, sometimes small. Never once a declaration of war. Who makes the decision to intervene militarily? I'll tell you who it is. It's the President of the United States. It's not the Congress. I don't think that's what the Founding Fathers intended. But 2008 is not 1789, and that's the way it is. If you tell me about the Congress, you say, well, Congress got the power of the purse, but be careful of that. If you go back over the last 10 or 20 years, you'll see that the Congress of the United States simply rubber stamps 95% of the federal budget. The real arguments about the federal budget don't take place on Capitol Hill. They take place in the offices of the Office of Management and Budget. That's where the real arguments take place. The President of the United States is the chief budget maker, not the Congress. Now, don't misunderstand me. The Congress shift around $100 million, $500 million here and there. That's not unimportant. Can be very can be very important. But in terms of the total budget, it's peanuts. So I worry. I really worry about this. I don't know if anybody else worries about it. I worry about it. How long, how far down this road can you go ceding power to the executive branch and still have a representative democracy? I don't know. Independent. When you're sworn into office, I don't know what you do in the state, I held up my hand and said, I swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. 
What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that I swear to uphold and defend the President of the United States. That doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that I swear and uphold the, the views of my constituents. Doesn't mean that either. It's the Constitution you swear to. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of different things to different people, but surely it means separate and equal branches of government. That's what the Constitution's all about. And surely it means when Carl gave me a very nice compliment, he called me an institutionalist. That's a big word. Do you know what it means, Carl? <laughs> I had to think a little bit myself. <laughs> but you swear to uphold the Congress? I, look, anybody in the country can run for Congress by running against the Congress. You ever heard that done? I used to do it myself. <laughs> then I got to thinking. I said, I can't do that anymore. I can't really do that anymore. Majority, minority, doesn't make any difference. I'm a member of the institution. And the bottom line is i got to try to make the country work. That's the bottom line. And I have, as a member of this institution, an obligation to it. And I just can't spend all my time attacking it. Criticism, of course. I, I'll make a lot of criticism of the Congress. I will in a few minutes. But underlying that all, you have to have a respect for the institution. If you're a part of it, you've got to make it work, it seems to me. Well, the Congress is a political body. You don't want to forget that. Every person you visit is a politician up there on the hill. And what a politician has to do is deal with a multitude of pressures. They really do. Let's not joke about it. It's tough. We just had a marvelous example of that in the Congress, the agricultural bill. I don't know whether anybody pays much attention to it or not. It's a hugely important bill, particularly if you're in the smaller town areas and agriculture. A multiplicity of interests. Not just about growing corn and soybeans. When I went to the Congress, we had three or four farm groups in the, in the country that lobbied the Congress on the agriculture bill. Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, Grange, so forth. Look at what's happening on the agriculture bill. Hundreds of lobbyists. I ran into a guy the other day who's representing the macadamia nut people. They got their own lobbying group. <laughs> but it's not just food. It's, look, school lunches, food stamps, humane treatment of animals. Goes on and on and on. A multiplicity of interests in a single bill. And it really is tough as a legislator to try to understand all of those interests and Accommodate them as best you can in a single bill. And of course, they don't always agree with one another, do they? But that's the job of the politician, and it's a political body. And they have to respond to their constituents. Read that insightful article in the paper today by Bob Samuelson on how tough it is for a politician to represent people, when the people don't want to hear about solutions. <laughs> Everybody wants energy independence, right? Nobody wants to do the things you have to do to get there. I gave a speech in the House of Representatives back in the 1970s on energy. Now, you know you're getting old when you start reading your old speeches. <laughs> but I could give that speech today. I wouldn't have to change more than a few words here and there. We haven't learned much at all. We're the slowest learners I've ever seen. 
on energy. We are really dumb, slow. We just can't get it through our heads what has to be done to get energy independence and remove our dependence from these dangerous and volatile areas of the world in the Middle East. As a legislator, I bet you never had people who wanted to cut, span cut spending and expand services. You ever run into that one? <laughs> <laughs> Congressman, we gotta cut this budget. By the way, could you increase that subsidy? Well, you talk about trying to square the circle. That's it. Pretty tough to do. It's a very important body, the United States Congress. I sat down with a group of constituents in my southern Indiana constituency not long ago. They said, well, the Congress of the United States is irrelevant. Well, that got my dander up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> irrelevant. Nothing like calling somebody irrelevant. Boy. <laughs> but that's what they call me, irrelevant. I said, how did you get here? Oh, we drove down I-65. You have any grandparents? Are they on Social Security? Medicare? Yes. You have any children going to college? Yes. Anybody on a Pell Grant? Yes. I knew the people I was talking to. <laughs> Good lawyer always knows the answer before he has the question. <laughs> well, you get the point. It's a body that importantly affects your life. And because it is, <laughs> we ought to take an interest in it. I had a high school kid one day conducting a convocation. And uh, you know, I think as a politician you get a little overconfident sometime in dealing with kids and think you're an awful lot smarter than they are. Incidentally, I, I'll wander for a moment. I'll come back to this story and tell you another one. I got a four-year-old granddaughter. Her mother the other day asked her, what's a mother do? And she expected the response, well, they fix the dinners, they drive me to school, and so forth. You know what she said, the four-year-old daughter? Mothers transform society. <laughs> I tell you, the, the whole family scratching their heads on that one. <laughs> I didn't even know she knew the word society. <laughs> or transform. <laughs> boy, oh boy. Anyway, go back to my high school. If I can remember the story at this point. <laughs> A nice young lady gets up, very courteous, deferential, said, well, what's the purpose of the United States Congress? Well, you can answer that a lot of ways. You can talk about passing a budget that sort of thing. But you know the historic purpose of the United States Congress? Its, its great mission is to maintain freedom in the country. Far more important than the passage of any piece of legislation to maintain freedom. Has it done that perfectly? Of course not. Has it done it reasonably well? I'd argue yes. But I guess it's debatable. Well, she came back at me. She said, I think it's all about a big ego trip. <laughs> She's not all wrong. You ever been to the United States Senate? Now, the house is very different. <laughs> Ego trip. And then she said, it's a power play, isn't it? You all want power. 
She wasn't wrong there either. <laughs> it's the name of the game, isn't it? That's why you run for election. You got power. It's not all bad. Maybe, it, maybe I'm stating it a little too bluntly. But it is a power struggle. We got an election coming up. It's a power struggle, fundamentally. Another fellow popped up in that audience and said, oh, I know why you're in politics, Hamilton. You're out there to get rich. <laughs> well, I could counter that, but I didn't bother to. But then I read something. I read a statement by a historian who said that the purpose of these legislatures is a search for a remedy. I kind of like that. That's what you're trying to do. You got all of these tough problems out here. You're searching for a remedy. Not just any remedy, but a remedy that will reasonably satisfy the American people. And that's what we try to do. Should I quit? Okay. I was going to go into the, uh, I'll run through them very quickly. Carl's about to go berserk down here. He's got to keep up schedule. I'm gonna, I got to pay attention to him. He's my leader. Chuck Quigley sat through this whole thing. He knows it all, but he's sitting there anyway. I appreciate that, Chuck. You're... But look, I, I said it there early on that the Congress is an institution under a lot of stress. I really believe it is. It is not functioning well. And I worry about that too. I've already indicated to you, I think it cedes too much power to the president. You see, I believe the Constitution says that the best way for our country to adopt public policy is by a, a kind of a creative tension between the legislature and the judicial and the executive branch. And out of that creative tension, there emerges better public policy. That's kind of the premise to me of the Constitution. And so I think, uh, I don't need to illustrate this anymore, we've ceded too much power, but that's not the only problem. There's been a breakdown in oversight by the United States Congress, doing a little better, I think, under some of our chairman up there. You know, the, everybody in the country's jumping on President George Bush because of the weapons of mass destruction were not uh, found in Iraq. Well, blame the president if you want to, but what about the United States Congress? They had the same information. Where were they? The presidents get most all the blame. Co-equal branch of government, same information as the president. Why didn't they speak up on it? Lack of oversight. There's been a breakdown in process. Do you know what an omnibus bill is? Huh? It's an abomination, that's what it is. <laughs> it throws off the wind of transparency, accountability. An omnibus bill is where they bring all of the appropriation bills, throw them into one bill, finish it at 3 o'clock in the morning, give it to you, vote on it at 10 o'clock, up or down. That's an omnibus bill. The budget process is, you know the last time the Congress followed the regular order of the budget process? Fourteen years ago. And they're at it again this year. They're not even going to pass a budget this year. Outrageous, in my view. I could go into why. I won't get into it. Breakdown in civility, of course. Don't need to argue that point. Breakdown in ethics, of course. Surely the ethical standard of the United States Congress ought to be better, higher, than whether or not a person has committed a felony. <laughs> but that's about where we are. These ethics committees don't meet. They're not doing anything. Well, look, what's the solution to all of this? It's not all that difficult. The Congress simply has to assert its constitutional power. That's it. 
It has to pass a, a budget by passing as it did for years and years and years, one appropriation bill at a time, bringing it onto the floor, letting members uh, offer amendments. Can't do that much anymore. Have the Senate go through the same process, reconcile it in the conference committee, send it to the president. You want to know if members don't have anything to do? When they come down to the end of a session, I'm going to give you a big secret here. You go up to Capitol Hill at the end of a session when they're getting ready for an omnibus bill to come out onto the floor, and members of Congress don't have anything to do. They're sitting around waiting for the bill to come out. Where is the bill being crafted? The bill is being crafted by a handful of people, not all of whom are members of Congress, and I, handful means handful, maybe 20, maybe 10, in the leadership offices, a few key players, and the rest of the members just sitting there. You've got to return to regular order. And when you hold up your hand and say, I will uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, you better mean it. Thank you.